In 1740, Commodore George Anson of the British Royal Navy was commissioned to circumnavigate the globe to find treasure. Of his five ships and 1,000 men, Anson returned with only one ship and less than 150 of his men. Of the 855 men that were lost on the voyage, most of them succumbed to scurvy. Scurvy is an affliction that causes lethargy, small hemorrhages on the lower extremities, lack of healing in wounds, swollen gums and loosening teeth, and finally, cardiac hemorrhages. Throughout the 15th century to the 18th century, it was often seen in sailors who embarked on long voyages. In 1746, James Lynn, a Scottish physician and surgeon, accompanied the ship HMS Salisbury to sea. During that voyage, Lynn took 12 men suffering from advanced scurvy and divided them into six groups of two. All of the men received the same diet, except that group one received cider each day, an alcoholic drink based on fermented fruit juice. Group two received seawater each day, Group 3 received a mash of garlic, horseradish, and mustard each day. Group 4 received vinegar each day. Group 5 received a dilution of sulfuric acid. And Group 6 received two oranges and a lemon each day. The group that received the citrus fruit made a quick and remarkable recovery, while the others did not. Lind concluded that citrus fruits on long voyages could prevent scurvy. Thus, James Lind is credited with conducting the first ever clinical trial. It was not, however, until 1753, some seven years later, that James Lind published his Treatise on Scurvy, to be read by other physicians and the Navy. And the practice of making sure sailors receive citrus juice on long voyages was not instituted by the British Royal Navy until 1795. So it took 50 years from clinical trial and proof to an actual change in practice. Evidence-based medicine requires that those in the healthcare fields look for the most current evidence to help their patients. So if evidence is published in 2012, practitioners take advantage of that new evidence to provide their patients and clients with the very best care in 2012. Sackett, Rosenberg, Gray, Haynes, and Richardson's article, published in 1996, set the current standard for evidence-based medicine. Since that time, the term has morphed from EBM to EBP, or evidence-based practice, moving through the healthcare system from medical doctors to all healthcare fields. Evidence-based practice is the culmination of three specific areas of knowledge. First, the evidence. All experiments and clinical trials that have been published in medical journals and books. Second, the practitioner's expert knowledge. This is your knowledge that you are gaining through your classes, your clinicals, and will gain in your practice. Third, your knowledge of your patient, their practices, beliefs, and preferences. Where these three areas of knowledge converge, the patient or client receives the very best care. Here's a dramatic example. You are a medical doctor and have a patient who is severely adverse to taking any kind of pill. Not only that, but the patient probably does not have the money to cover a prescription. The patient has strep throat, and the evidence shows that the best possible course of treatment is antibiotics. But you know that the patient won't take those pills. Do you still prescribe the pills? Or do you go through the evidence to come up with an alternative treatment? Think about it. When you start practice in a few years or sooner, do you think your education will end? You know that treatments, pharmaceuticals, and medical technology are all changing at a rapid pace. You will need to keep up with the advances being made in your field so that you can provide the best possible care to your patients and clients. In the meantime, you will be gaining your own expertise with each patient or client that you work with, with every conference you attend, and by communicating with colleagues. You will witness what does and does not work. Evidence-based practice is a continual learning process.